Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Please turn with me to page two of the order of worship, and let's pray the prayer for illumination together. Let's pray. Living God, help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, scripture lesson this morning is taken from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2, verses 14 to 19. Verse 14. Is Israel a servant, a slave by birth? Why then has he become plunder? Lions have roared. They have growled at him. They have laid waste his land. His towns are burned and deserted. Also, the men of Memphis and Tarpanis have shaved the crown of your head. Verse 17, have you not brought this on yourselves by forsaking the Lord your God when he led you in the way? Now why go to Egypt to drink water from Shehor? And why go to Assyria to drink water from the river? Your wickedness will punish you. Your backsliding will rebuke you. Consider then and realize how evil and bitter it is for you when you forsake the Lord your God and have no awe of me, declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, church. Yes, it's a wonderful morning, it's a wonderful day, and I see some people are complaining it's a bit too cold. Anyone too cold here? You all feeling fine? If you are too cold, you need more fire. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, take out your sermon notes with me as we prepare to hear God's word. But before that, let's go to God in prayer. Hallelujah. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Saviour, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise, all the honour and all the glory. And Lord, this morning, once again, we ask for you to come and fill us with your spirit, Lord. Lord, we open our hearts and our minds to hear from you. Lord, we want to hear your voice. We want to hear your spirit. Speak directly to our spirit. Convict our hearts. Change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. How many of you got lost before? I mean, when you're driving in the road, driving in a car, you know, and you'll get lost before. How many of you have got, gotten lost before in your life? Amen. There's so many of you. You know something, ladies, let me tell you something. Men, we don't get lost, you know. We never get lost. We only take, sometimes, we take alternative routes, but we never get lost. <laughs> All right? And, you know, let me ask you this. When you are lost, when you are driving on the wrong road and you're lost, how do you know that you are lost? How do you know that you're lost? Two ways. One is when I'm driving, and suddenly I start looking around, nothing looks familiar. The road looks, looks, looks weird. Then I know something is wrong. Then I know that I'm lost. But if you still don't know, if you look at around the road and you still don't see anything different, you definitely know when you're lost, when by the time you come to the end of the road and you reach your destination and it's not the destination you want, then you know that you are definitely lost. You know, but, but oftentimes that is too late, right? By the time you reach, you don't want to know that you are lost after you have reached the place and then you realise that you've reached the wrong place. You don't want to know, you want to know earlier. I mean, you don't want to waste hours of driving and you don't want to spend, drive old miles just to realise you are on the wrong road. I mean, imagine this. Imagine you're from KL and you're driving down to Malacca and you start driving and you keep driving and driving along the Plus Highway down to Malacca. After one hour, after two hours, eh, how come I haven't reached Malacca yet? Ah? Then you keep driving three hours already, then four hours. You don't want to wait until you reach Penang before you realise you're on the wrong road. Correct? 
You don't want that to happen. And you know something, friends? This morning, you know, God loves each and every one of us so much. God loves us so much that He doesn't want that to happen to us. He doesn't want us to wait till we reach the end of the road to realize that we are on the wrong road. And He wants to warn us early. And that's what He did for the nation of Israel. Let me read to you again in Jeremiah 2 verse 18. It says this, But now, what are you doing on the road to Egypt? To drink the waters of the Nile? What are you doing on the road to Egypt? You see, the story of Israel is like this. Israel was delivered from the nation of Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. For 400 years, God was not real in their lives. For 400 years, they did not have a touch from God. For 400 years, God was nothing more than a legend to them. But after 400 years, God delivered them with a mighty hand, a great miracle. God changed their lives around and God brought them into the promised land. A promised land, a place where God's will is fulfilled for their life. A place where God's promises becomes a reality in their life and God becomes real to them. And now they are in the promised land. They enjoy life. Their things are prospering. And as things are prosper, and just like you and I, when things get good, we begin to forget about God. And we begin to revert to our old ways. We begin to revert to the things that we used to do. And God is asking them, tell, and through the prophet Jeremiah, God is asking the Israelites, why? You are already in the promised land. I've given you the promised land. Why are you now turning back and going on the road to Egypt? Why are you going back to Egypt? Why are you on the road to Egypt? And many of us are like that sometimes in our lives. You know, so many times God has delivered us from our Egypts. You know, many of us, God has delivered us from many things in our lives. For some of us, God could have delivered us from a bad relationship that we've been suffering with. For some of us, God has delivered us from a bad, a destructive habit that's been destroying our lives. For some of us, God has been delivering us from a lifestyle that is destructive, that, that, that doesn't fulfill His plan. But for each and every one of us, God has delivered us from a life that does not know Him, a life that is outside the will of God, a life that is outside the blessings of God. And God has delivered us from that life into a life of blessing, into a life of His will, into a life of His promises. But like the Israelites, many times we find ourselves going back on the road to Egypt, traveling down that road to Egypt once again, going back to something that God has already delivered us from, going back to that which God has, something, something in our life that should have been done and dealt with. Our old life, our past life is done and is dealt with, but yet we keep going back to it. I remember when I was in a church, uh, it's a small church in a small town, when I was pastoring that church, we had a lady there, a single lady who lived all alone, and you know, like, you, you heard all the stories, right, about single ladies get dubbed by some Casanova and they try to cheat their money and everything. Well, this is basically the same case that happened. And so this girl was, this lady was cheated by this guy who came to say sweet words, I love you, I need you, and all these sort of things, and started cheating her of her money, stealing her jewelries and everything. And since she had no family and no one around, the pastor had to be the paikia, go there, kick the fella out of the house, chase him away, and lock it up, lock it all up, set things in order and protect her from him. And, it, and it's what we did. We came, we settled things, we got rid of the guy. I mean, money that's lost is lost, you can't do anything, but at least he stopped, doesn't cheat her anymore. And we stopped it and we counseled her and she's okay. We counseled her that don't stop, stop doing it, stop giving in to him and everything was fine. After a couple of weeks, one day she called me up and was crying and said, Pastor, 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 the guy stole some money from me again. I said, huh? How? Did he break into your house? Did he knock down the door and steal the money? He said, no, no. He just came in and he said something nice to me and I opened the door and I let him into the house. I was looking at him and said, what are you doing that for? Why are you going back to Egypt? Why are you going back to something that God has already delivered you from? And likewise in our lives, you know, friends, God loves us so much. That many times we are on that road to Egypt, but God loves us so much that, be, that He plays road signs for us so that we realize we are on the wrong road. I mean, it's like this, you know, road signs is like this. There was one time I was driving from KL to Malacca. And as I was driving, I remember I was, I was, I, was, I mean, we usually come out of Alogaja exit, you know, the plus highway, Alogaja exit. You all know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, so Alogaja exit. And I was driving, I was thinking, hey, how come I haven't seen the exit, Alogaja exit yet? Uh? I keep driving, driving, where's the exit? Uh? Then suddenly I come across a signboard, it says, I curl two kilometers. 
and I know I've already missed the Alor Gaja exit, but thank God you have an Aikero exit. Otherwise, I will go all the way to JB or whatever to U turn back to Malacca. And you know, thank God for road signs to tell you that you have missed the junction or that you're on the wrong road. And likewise, God loves each and every one of us so much that when we are on the road to Egypt, God actually places road signs for us. So that when we see the road signs in our lives, we know that I'm on the wrong road. I better turn back. I better get out of this road because I'm on the wrong road, a road leading to Egypt. So what are the road signs? Would you write me the first point of your note is this. That the road signs, the first sign that you're on the road to Egypt is when your success is defined by the world. When your success is defined by the world. How do you define success? How do you find what is successful? Well, basically, there are three ways people define success. The first way success is normally defined, firstly, internally. Basically, you, what's what inside, inside of you, your own ambition, your own desire, you know, you, you long for something. And when I get it, ooh, I'm successful. So sometimes success is defined internally. But the problem with that is, you know, all of us know we have a flesh part in us, right? And most of the time, my desire, my wants, it's very fleshy. And, it's, and the Bible says, you know, the things of the flesh is always in enmity with the things of God. For the carnal mind will never know the mind of the spirit. And so, you know, our flesh is always, in, is always fleshy. The, the second thing that we will know, the way we can define success, or success can be defined, the second way, is externally. Basically what people define for us. People, our family, our friends, or the world define for us. Sometimes very often it's our parents. You know, sometimes our parents will define what success is. You know, sometimes when you grow up, your parents say, you know, I never had the chance to be a doctor. I wanted to be a doctor, but I never had a chance to be a doctor. Now you have a chance to be a doctor. So when you become a doctor, you'll be successful. And that becomes in your mind, if I'm only a successful if I become a doctor, because that's what my parents define for me. It becomes an external definition. And sometimes, very often, it is what the world defines that we take as success. Because we are bombarded every day by television, by advertisements, by novels, by things in the world. You go around the street, you go around the kopitiam, you go everywhere, you're bombarded day and night by the things of the world. And these things keep telling us what success is. And the world's idea of success is always nothing short in various forms. It always boils down to money and power. Whether you're in a position of influence, a position of power, a position of a certain position, power or money. And that's the world's definition of success. The third way success is defined, which we need to learn, is what they call the etern it can be defined eternally. It can be defined eternally, and basically it's by how God sees success. What God sees as success, what is valued by God. And listen to this, friends. What is what success is defined eternally is very often in contradiction with what it is defined internally and externally. In other words, what you and I sometimes desire, what the world often defines success is, is very often in contradiction with what God, how God defines the success. And that's why in Revelation 3.17, God was telling the Laudation Church, He says this, Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. In other words, what God is saying is, you know, because you think that you are rich, you think you are wealthy, you think you are successful, but in my eyes, you are nothing but wretched, miserable, poor, and blind. What is God's will? What is God's definition of success? Well, it's basically this. When you fulfill the will of God in your life, when you live in the perfect plan of God, when you live under the plan and the will and the purposes of God, my friends, is success in the eyes of God. For in the eyes of God, nothing is most important, other, nothing is more important than a relationship with Him and a relationship with mankind. That's what God defines as success. And when we live in that perfect will of God, the will that God has for your life, that is success. And it could be different. It could be slightly different for different people. For some of us sitting here, you know, maybe you are a mother and your, your idea of success is that I want to 
hit a certain career, I want to be independent, I want to be a successful lady out, work, working lady out there. And the Lord may be asking you and saying, no, my idea for you, my plan for you is to raise up the children that I've given you to be godly men and women. Because among them, I've planned a Joshua, I've planted a Moses among them, and I need you to be the one to groom them up and to raise them up. And if you are out there busy doing something else other than what God has planned for you, that may not be, that may, it is not success in the eyes of God. For some of us, you know, man, we are chasing after our careers and we are trying to build certain things, we are trying to provide for the family, we are trying to earn enough so that our family will never suffer, will never be poor, will never have, will have enough for their education. And the Lord is saying, no, maybe I've been calling you to a certain full-time ministry. And that is my will, my plan for you. And unless, no matter how much you achieve on this side, unless you fulfill the plans and the purposes of God, there's no success in your life. And so friends, the problem is for us is oftentimes we allow the world to define what is important, to define what is success because we want to please the world, we want to please the people around the world rather than God. And we oftentimes adopt the world's definition of success because that is who we want to look good in front. We want to look wonderful in front of the eyes of the world. We want to please the world. And that's why the Bible says, I mean, not, not, not the Bible, you know, that's why, you see, when God delivered us from our Egypt, from the bondages in our lives, at first we get excited. We want to live out God's purpose. We want God's will for our lives. But over time, we begin to fall back. We get comfortable. We begin to long fall back to the def de definition of the world of success. And we begin to go back on the road to Egypt because we want to please the world. And you know, someone once said this, if God is pleased, it doesn't matter who you displease. But if God is displeased, it doesn't matter who you have pleased. Let me say that again. If God is pleased, it doesn't matter who in the world you displease. But if God is displeased, it doesn't matter who on earth you have pleased. How do you know whether I'm following the world's definition or God's definition of success? Very simple. Look at your priorities. Look at the way you spend your energy, your priorities in your life. What do I mean by that? Let me put it this way. All of us, in life, we are given, you know, I like, I like to look at the, 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 our focus or our priorities in terms of the amount of energy we spend in things. So all of us, in a given day, we have something like maybe six ounces of energy or six pockets of energy, all right? Which we, which we have, we can do anything we want with it. And a normal, typical person will usually be start off when things are wonderful and good, which is how God intends for us. Most of the time, we would spend maybe the first three pockets of energy at work, doing our work, whether it's career or whether it is if you are a housewife, your children and taking care of the house, or if you are a retiree, whatever that you spend taking care of grandchildren, that's your work. Okay, so that's your work. And we often allocate one pocket of energy for God, to build our relationship with God, doing our quiet time and all that. Another pocket of energy for our family, spend time with them. Another pocket of energy for ourselves. So, you know, we need, I mean, to be honest, come on, we need to take care of ourselves, right? You know, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, you need to take care of yourself. And so, we, have, we normally spend this. But this is what happens, this is how we know whether our prior, where our priorities are. Many times, when we receive too much stress here, okay, that's, that's faster. When we receive too much stress here, what happens is we will replace this pocket of energy rather than giving it to God, we end up spending more time on work because we have too much stress, too much, we, we can't finish the things we need to do here. Three, we find three pockets of energy not enough, so we need to give more energy. And then when we find that it's still not enough because of too much pressure, too much commitments, too much deadlines or whatever, then we sacrifice the next one, that is family, and we'll give that over to work as well. And if that also is not enough, we will find ourselves giving up the last one and we also give that to our work and we end up something like this. Friends, that shows us where our priorities is. If you find yourself giving up certain pockets of energy for what that should be there, for your family, relationship with one another, for God, relationship with God, for yourself, relationship with God and yourself, to care. if you see yourself giving that up for what the world defines as success, then friends, chances are if you've got this, your priority mixed up, chances are you're following the definition of the world of success in your life. 
and you're already on the road to Egypt. Just take a moment here, I'm just going to talk to the guys for a moment. You know, sometimes, you know, we like to spend a lot of times in career. We like to build our career. It's important, yes. It's important to earn money. To, but let me ask you this. And it's always, often, I mean, it's always whenever there's stress, even, go back again, go back again, because I have to do Even sometimes when there's a stress in the family side, or wherever there's a stress in our health side, for some reason, the first thing we will always give up is the God side, the God energy. Somehow that's the first thing we sacrifice. We will give it to either more to the family, or we'll give it more to ourselves, or we'll give it more to work. Somehow that is not the first thing we'll sacrifice. And when that is not enough, the next thing that goes will be our family. For some reason, we are wired that way. And that shows our priority. I just want to say something to the guys for a moment here is this. You know, friends, sometimes you can be so caught up with your career, with the things that you are called to do, that you are doing to earn a living. And sometimes, let me ask you this, you know, no matter how wonderful a career you have, no matter how good the job that you have, sooner or later, one day in your life, it will come to an end. You will retire, you will grow old and you become useless by the company, they will fire you or whatever. There will come a day when that career comes to an end. It will. The question then is this. If you have been giving all the pockets of energy to just your career, when that comes to an end, what do you have to walk into? When you walk out of that phase of life, when you walk out of that career life, what else do you have left to walk into? If you have never spent the time to invest in your family, who I wish, where are you going to walk into? If you never spend the time to invest in God and a church, where will you walk into, friends? Think about it. You know, someone once said this, your career is what you are paid for. Your calling is what you are made for. And that's, where we, where that's, that's the difference between the road to Egypt. When we are on the road building up our career alone, that is the road to Egypt. But when we are on the road to God's promised land, that is what we are trying to fulfill, what God made us for. Not what we are paid for, but what we are made to be. And so friends, the first sign is that when you, when you allow the world to define success in your life. The second road sign that you're on the road to Egypt is when your mind longs for the pleasures of the world. When your mind longs for the pleasures of the world. Exodus 16.1, the whole Israelite committee, community, set out from Elim and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. Then the Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. You see, this, Israelite, this bunch of Israelites, uh, they just left the Egypt. They just left Egypt and they're on the way to the promised land and they came across the desert. The first thing that when they sat down in the desert, the first thing that crossed their mind is, oh, how I miss the pots of meat in Egypt. Oh, how I miss all the nice T-bone steaks there. How I miss all the roti chanai there, all the laksa there, all the curry ayam chicken there. You know, that's the first thing that comes to their mind. They miss the pleasures in Egypt. Sometimes we are like that, friends. Sometimes, you know, even though we have been delivered from an, our old life, we have been done and dealt with with the old past, but sometimes in our lives, in our minds, we still long for, how I wish I can still drink a bit more. How I wish I can still enjoy that uh, certain programs that I know I shouldn't be watching. How I wish I can go and play a bit of mahjong and throw a bit of money, visit a bit of casino. How I wish I can go on the internet and look at things that I shouldn't be looking at. After all, I look but I don't touch any my window shopping, my nothing wrong with it. You know, and are we play it in our minds. And we, our minds begin to long for the old things that God has already delivered us from. It could be a past hurts. And sometimes we, in our mind, we long back for that. Oh, if only I can still be angry at that fella. If only I can still take my revenge at that person. And we play it in our minds. And we, we start to look around. And we look around and look at the pleasures that is around the world. And in our minds, we long for it. We think of it in the back of our mind, say, how, wish, how I wish I can do that. How nice it would be to enjoy it. In fact, 1 John 2, 16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Let me tell, let me tell you this, friends. Let's be honest. Lah. Whoever said that sin is not fun? Who 
ever said that sin is not pleasurable? I mean, don't listen to some of those holy, holy fellows say, sin, bad. Sin, no pleasure. No, no enticement at all. Come on lah, okay? Be, let's be human here, alright? Sin is pleasurable. Sin is fun. But it will kill you. Yes, it is pleasurable, but it will kill you. It's fun, but it will bring death in your life. It will destroy your life. Yes, but nevertheless, it is pleasurable. It is. And, be, and that's the tactic of the enemy. It's not to get you to sin. He knows that you, as a Christian, we are too far up the road to actually sin. But what the devil does is he gets your mind to start thinking about sin. To start considering sin. Thinking of the, is it, maybe it's, it, that the sin is probably a possibility in my life. That I may, if opportunity comes, I might consider whether I will sin or not. And the, the, the devil gets you to think that way, he knows you're in his grabs. Because, of, you know, that's why we always say, the devil is a headhunter. Your minds are the battlefield. Your imagination is the trophy. Let me say again, the, bat- the devil is a headhunter. Your minds are the battlefield. Your imagination is the trophy. And when he can get your imagination, the trophy, when he can get you to start imagining how nice that sin would be, how nice that worldly pleasure would be, how nice that that, 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 that internet website would be, and he gets you to start imagining it, the devil knows he's got you. And when we start doing that, we start allow our imagination to go that way. We begin to entertain what I call wandering thoughts. We allow our minds to wander. We wander into the places where we should not wander. We wander into the websites that we should not wander. We wander into the, uh, into the certain bars and clubs that we should not wander. And our minds wanders over there. I mean, you know, go back to Eve. How did Eve sin in the Garden of Eden? Did Eve just wake up in the morning and say, okay, this is a wonderful day to sin against God? No. Did Eve pass by the tree every day and say, okay, wait, uh, one day I'm going to sin against God? No. If it just happened most likely, day after day as she passed by the tree, she began to have wandering thoughts, which says, I wonder, how does that fruit taste like? Ah? Oh, I wonder, how come a pretty fruit like that can be so bad for me? I wonder, why, what would happen if I eat that fruit? Ah? I wonder why God didn't want me to eat that fruit. Ah? And then you got to begin to allow wandering thoughts to enter your life and then when the devil comes on the picture he just fuels that wandering thought and before he knows it Eve was in his grabs and that's how the devil works my own life most of you know that I, I used to come from the corporate world I, was, I used to be in the electronics industry and you know there was a time in my life when I truly truly missed that life to be honest I still miss that life I still miss doing our electronics R&D work and with all the gadgets and all those things. I still missed it. But there was a time in my life when I really, really missed it. After I got into full-time ministry, I missed it. And I used to go to, I even go on the websites and start going to Job Street and see, now what is on opening? uh? What is my previous company? What what, what else is, what, what openings are there? And begin to look and begin to, you know, and not only that, you know, I begin to, uh, Think, I begin to imagine how nice it would be if I was still doing that job. What, how, where would I be today if I was still at my old job? I mean, my last drawn salary is still more than what I'm getting today. And I, sometimes I imagine if I still have my last drawn salary plus how many years since I've left, what will I be getting today? And I imagine it. And I begin to think and my, and my mind keep wandering that way. And to the point... I even have dreams about it. I begin to sleep at night, I'll be dreaming. Oh, you know, I dream that I'll be working back in my old company and I'll be doing this and I'll be doing that. And we have a dream about it. And the Holy Spirit just convicted me and said, you know, why are you thinking about it? Why are you allowing your minds to wander from a place that, you have, that should have been done with, should have been dealt with, a chapter that should have been closed in your life? Why do you allow your mind to still wander there? Why do I allow myself to go on the road to Egypt? And because of that, I had to learn. I had to learn what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, 4. He says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down every argument and every high thing that exhausts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. 
I had to learn to do that. I had to learn to bring every thought captive. Whatever wandering thoughts there are, thoughts that begin to wonder about the company, to begin to wonder about my old job, all the imagination, I had to bring that captive into the, the, uh, into the knowledge of into the obedience of Jesus Christ. I had to bring it captive. And sometimes there are certain things that I need to do. Certain things that we need to just cut off. You know, I remember I had well, one time I had to do some spring cleaning and I actually had to just gather together all those things that, you know, sometimes you left your, you still keep some of those old things like some, some little equipment, la, some little gadgets. La. I just had to just pack all of those and just phew, cut it off. Because I had to take every thought captive in Jesus Christ. And let me encourage you to do this exercise. Colossians 3 2 says this set your minds on things above and not things on the earth. Let me ask you this. If, you all, if I ask all of you to draw a pie chart of your thoughts, your thought life, a pie chart, you know it's a pie chart, right? A pie chart. Ah, there, there's a pie chart. Okay, you know it's a pie chart. How big, let's say you have a pie chart. One, one area is for the things you think about work. You're working, you're doing your work, you think about your work, okay. Another pie chart are the thoughts you have about your family. Oh, I'm longing to go back and visit my wife. I miss my wife at work. You know, obviously you think of your family, you think of your children. How many percentage of it do you think about God? Oh, how I miss having my quiet time. Oh, you know, I'm waiting to go to church on Sunday. You think about God. And how many percentage of it do you entertain wandering thoughts? Thoughts that just wanders off and thinking about things that you shouldn't be thinking. Thinking about pleasures that you have, should have cut off long ago. Thinking about good things in Egypt that you so long for. How many percentage is that? How big is that, friends? In your own mind, in your own daily thoughts. Set your minds on things above and not things below. If your minds are constantly wandering, your thoughts are constantly wandering to things that you shouldn't be thinking about, it's just a matter of time when you, when you will get there, when you will reach there. You know, the devil knows that if he's able to get you to just consider sin, not act on it, but to consider it, to long for it, it's just a matter of time before he gets you to actually commit it. You know, there's a story that's told of this fisherman who works in the border between Mexico and the States, the United States. And he goes out to the sea, deep sea fishing, and comes back. And you know, Mexico is famous for drugs. And so there were these drug dealers that came, drug pushers that came to this fisherman. And they offered him a certain sum of money to bring drugs over to the United States, to smuggle it over. Of course, he refused. Every month when he came back from the sea, these drug dealers would come approach him again. And each time they approach him, they were up the, vet, the money, they were up the rewards. And every time they do it, he would re reject them. Over and over again, until after three years, he finally, this fisherman finally went to the border patrol and turned in all these guys who had been pushing drugs to him. The border patrol asked him, how long has this been going on? He says, oh, about three years. Three years? Why didn't you report them sooner? Why now only do you start reporting them? The fisherman looked at the border patrol and said, because they are coming too close to my price. They're getting too close to my price. The devil knows when he can get you to start considering it, to just start thinking about it, it's just a matter of time before he gets your price. But if he can't, but if your mind is taken captive, if your mind is in obedience to Christ and you don't allow your mind to wander off, the devil knows he can't do anything to you. How strong is your mind? The first thing, friends, the first road sign is whether our success is defined by the world, our priorities. The second is our mind. How, what do we entertain? The thoughts in our mind. The third, friends, the third road sign is when your righteousness shifts according to the world. When your righteousness shifts according to the world. What do I mean by this? You know, back in seminary, when I was in seminary, I had a classmate who was from Australia. I mean, she's a Malaysian, but she came, she was sent by the Australian church. So she brought with her some imported cookies from Australia. I can't remember the brand. I can't remember the flavor. All I know, it was delicious. It was tasty. It was good. These cookies, very nice cookies. And I remember looking at the packaging when he first brought the package. 
I was, it was not yet open. Before you open it, I was looking at the packaging. And I saw it written there. One of the taglines for this cookie was this, sinfully delicious. And I was thinking to myself, what on earth is sinfully delicious? Does it mean that it's so sinful that it's delicious? Or that sin is delicious? Or that it's delicious that it's, that it's sin? I don't, what, what does it mean? You know, in fact, I went, to the, I went to the internet and I looked up urban lingos, lingos that they use today. Do you know there's actually a word that is used today they call sinfulicious? Sinfulicious. Which means sinfully delicious, sinfulicious. And I mean, what on earth does that mean? But one thing it shows is this. We don't take sin seriously anymore. The world doesn't take it anymore. I remember we passing, passing the packet around and all my friends were laughing. Oh, sinfully delicious. Ah. I'm very delicious. And we passing, these are all seminarian students. And they're all sinfully deliciously eating. I mean, what is it? We don't take sin seriously anymore. In fact, you know, today when we commit sin, we say, it's an honest mistake. It was unintentional. Oh, it's a fluke. I'm not normally like that. It's just a fluke. It was an oversight. You know, we don't take sin seriously anymore. And that's how the way it works. Things that used to be sin are no longer sin. Things that the world used to abhor, they no longer abhor, they welcome with open arms. Look at the homosexuality. Look at uh, divorce. Look at so many things in the world. Things that used to be a big no. It's now the world now welcomes in open arms. That's why Leviticus 18.3 says this, you must not do as they do in Egypt where you used to live. Do not follow their practices. You must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. I am the Lord your God. You see, friends, in other words, what God is saying, you know, when we start to follow the ways of the world, if we, start, we allow the world to define for us what is right and wrong, we are already on the road to Egypt. In fact, you are halfway there, you are almost reaching Egypt. When you allow the world to define for us what is right and wrong. Because the world's definition always changes. But God's standards never change. God's standards for the world, for, for righteousness, never change. And listen to this, friends. When we begin to follow the standards of the world, we will then begin to believe what the world believes. We may not say it, but our actions will show it. And we begin to believe what the world believes. And what the world believes is mainly that salvation is dependent on your good works. The world believes that as long as I'm a good person, as long as I don't murder, I don't kill, I don't commit major sins, as long as I'm a good person, I'll pretty much get go to heaven. I'm pretty much a good person. And that's what the world believes. But Ephesians 2, 8 reminds us, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Friends, if we are not careful, we will begin to follow the ways of the world. We will let the world dictate what is good and right. And we will begin to adopt the understanding of the world. And before you know it, we will begin to adopt the understanding that I, if I am righteous, I go to heaven. As long as I do righteous things, I will go to heaven. And we begin to forget the grace element. We begin to forget the grace of God. And so we will end up doing, we will still do our quiet time. We will still read the Bible. We will still come to church. But I do it because I'm, I want to be righteous and I want to go to heaven. That's why I read the Word of God. That's why I come to church. That's why I pray. Because I want to be righteous, I want to go to heaven. But we forget that we should actually be reading the Word of God. We should be coming to church, not because we want to go to heaven, not because of righteousness sake, but because we want we love God. Because we want to know Him more. Because we want to adore Him. Because we want to have a relationship with Him. And that's why we do the things we do. Not because I want to earn my righteousness and I want to go to heaven. And if we don't realize that, friends, we are already on the path to Egypt. When we begin to think that the things I do, I do it so that I can go to heaven, then you are no different from the Pharisees. Because that's what they did. They did a lot of things because they wanted to increase their righteousness so that they can go to heaven. But the Bible reminds us, you know, we are all like filthy rags. Each and every one of us, our righteousness are like filthy rags. And when we start doing the things, righteous things for the sake of of salvation rather than pure love for God, we are on the road to Egypt. I just want to close with this final point, friends. If you write me the last point in your notes, the road you are always on determines where you end up. The road that you are on will always determine where you will end up. Very logical, right? Very simple, very straightforward, very so logical. It sounds yet so 
many people just don't get it. So many people just don't get it. It's so simple, it's so straightforward, yet we miss the point altogether. Galatians 6, 7 says, For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. In other words, you know, it doesn't matter what you intend in your heart. It doesn't matter what your intentions are. The path that you take will determine where you end up. You know, I, I, can, I can intend all I want to drive to Malacca from KL. I can intend to go to Malacca. But if I'm driving north towards Penang, whatever, how much I intend, I will never reach Malacca. It's not what my intentions are, but it's the road that I'm taking that will determine where I end up. And many Christians intend to lead a good life. They intend to take the path to God's promised land, to take the path to God's will in their life. But they tend to live their lives on the other road leading to Egypt. Let me give you some examples. A single woman says, I want to meet and marry a good Christian guy who loves God. But she dates anyone who asks her out, especially if he's cute. Parents say, I want to raise godly children. And I want my children to love God, to grow up to love God. But they, but they place more emphasis or more priority on tuitions and studies and exams than they do in God. A father says, I want my children to respect and honour me but he flirts openly with all the women in church. A wife says, I want to have a good and loving relationship with my husband, but, he ne but she neglects him in place of the children. A mother says, I want my children to grow up in a loving, close-knitted family, but she spends all her time chasing her career, and the only time they see her is in the breakfast table. A young man says, I want to grow up to be a good Christian. But all he does is spend all his time in work and never any time for God or to journal or to spend quiet time with God. You know, I'm saddened how people just cannot connect the dots. They just cannot connect the dots between their actions and what they will reap in life. They just cannot connect the dots. It doesn't matter how much you intend. It doesn't matter how much you want. What is important is the road that you're on. And sometimes, friends, it's sometimes we, it's when we reach the end of the road before we realize that we are on the wrong road. And I pray this morning that you all won't, won't wait till you reach the end of the road to realize that you're on the road to Egypt. Do this with me. You know, before the day is out, you know your life best. I don't know your life. If I ask you, you will portray the best in your life to me. But you know the true condition of your life. The true things that you place priority in. The true things that your minds are wandering off. The true motives in which you love God and you serve God. Fast forward your life 10 years from now. Fast forward 20 years. Fast forward 30 years. Based on the condition that you know to be true in your life right now. And when you pass fast forward to 20, 30 years, what do you see? Paint that picture in your mind. Is that the future that you want? Is that the outcome that you want in your life? Is that the family that you want? Is that the relationship with your wife that you want? Is that the relationship with your children that you want? Is that your relationship with God that you want? Fast forward your life, 10, 20 years, and paint that picture. And if that's not the picture that you think you want, if based on what you are living right now, based on the road you are on right now, if that's not the picture you want, then friends, rewind that tape back now to where you are. And I pray that you take you go back to the road that you should travel. Turn back now. Don't wait until you reach the end to realize that you are on the wrong road. Let us pray. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Savior, mighty God. Lord, we give you the praise. All honour and all glory. And Lord, this, evening, we, this morning we ask once again for your spirit to come and fill our midst. For your spirit to come and speak to us, Lord. Lord, for those of us who may have strayed on the road to Egypt, and Lord, every one of us will stray. In certain times in our life, we will all stray. And for those of us who may stray or who will stray, Lord, I pray 
that you will give us the eyes to see and to recognize your road signs so that we do not stray too long and we know how to turn back. For those of us right now, this morning, who are already halfway on the road to Egypt, or who are already on the way, we are almost reaching Egypt, Lord, I pray that you open our eyes, you convict our hearts to turn back on the road to the promised land. Lord, I just commit each and every one of my brothers and sisters into your hands. Holy Spirit, convict their hearts. Do a deeper work in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, shall we stand and sing this closing hymn, I Am Thine Own Lord. And let's, let us just dedicate our lives to God. To dedicate to God that I want to be on the right road. Not the road to Egypt, but the road to His promised land. Let us stand to our feet. you leave this place, may you find yourself not on the road to Egypt, but on the road to God's promises for your life. And may the love of God the Father, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit keep you on that road to His promises. Amen.